Let us pray. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which not have not been told them they shall see, and that which they have not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For it grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with their infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their face, faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. He made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through knowledge, through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for their transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading from Hebrews 10. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart 
in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Lord, you, Lord. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He answered them, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put away your sword back in its sheath. I did, am I not to do drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Judeans that it would be better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, are, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all new Jews come together. I have, not, I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him a bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Judeans replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Judeans. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Judeans again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! But Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Judeans answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Judeans cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Judeans, Here is your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Judeans. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Judeans, but this man said, I am the king of the Judeans. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture say, says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Judeans did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a seeker of one because of his fear of the Judeans, asked Pilate to let him take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Judeans. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was also a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. In preparation for this moment, I found myself reflecting on our Wednesday Lenten theme of polarization, and in particular on Ash Wednesday, when I talked about the research of Adam Grant into how pride, or perhaps more accurately, hubris, contributes to the process of polarization through overconfidence. For those of you that don't happen to remember or didn't happen to be here, here's a quick overview. Grant says that uh, this process begins with a a sense of hubris, that we have it all figured out and we know that we are right. And as a result, we have this conviction then that we are right and we go out to demonstrate it to other folks. And in the process of doing that, we, we only look for and listen to those opinions, ideas that match our own, that confirm our bias, which of course then reinforces our our beliefs in the first place, it revalidates them, which then feeds right back into our belief that we've just got it all figured out. Well, Grant's research also showed how to break that overconfidence cycle and the polarization it reinforces when we shift our thinking from a stance of hubris to a stance of humility. Humility, I guess you might say, is is kind of like a guardrail or a curb on the road of life that protects us from going into the ditch of hubris. Humility is the recognition that one does not have it all figured out and that one does not have to. Instead, one is free to live in a cycle of rethinking and learning and relearning, or as he put it this way, Humility is the recognition that we don't have it all figured out. Maybe we know some parts, but maybe there's other parts that we haven't learned yet. And so when we come across something new, we maybe instill 
doubt what it is that we know, but doubt what it is that we're hearing too. And, and so that in turn leads us to start asking questions. What's going on? We become curious. And in the process of asking more questions, and as I like to say, digging deeper, we make new discoveries. And the process then it reinforces our humility of saying, see, we didn't know it all, but we learned something new and we're better for it. While humility in the Christian context is seen as a virtue, doubt, well, not so much. On the first Sunday after Easter, we always hear the story of doubting Thomas and how we should not be like him. When Thomas hears on Easter Sunday that Jesus has risen from the dead, he says that he will not believe unless he can put his hands in Jesus' wounds, in his hands, in his feet, and in his side. A week later, Jesus reappears when Thomas is around, and he invites Thomas to, to put his fingers in Jesus' wounds and see for himself. Don't doubt, but believe, is what our translation in English says. The only thing is, is that's not what the Greek actually says. You know, I gotta go digging deeper. What Jesus says to Thomas, however, is, don't disbelieve, believe. You see, the problem was not that Thomas doubted, that he had questions when he recognized that his life experiences did not match up with the other disciples' experience of Easter Sunday. Although I might add, if you may, may recall, that the other disciples didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead either, even when Jesus was standing right there in front of him. The problem was not that Thomas doubted, was curious. What about a process of, of inquiry and discovered that Jesus had risen from the dead, giving him a whole new point of view that empowered him to keep humbly learning new things? The problem was, not, the problem was that Thomas didn't believe. He was convinced that people don't rise from the dead, which was confirmed by his everyday life and thereby validated his worldview that he could take pride in. He'd figured it out, and without clear, specific, and tangible evidence, he wasn't going to change his mind, and maybe not even then. Of course, in meeting the risen Jesus, Thomas falls on his knees in humility and proclaims Jesus his Savior and Lord. He hadn't figured it all out after all, and was set free to live a newer, healthier life. But here's the kicker. The reason why I'm preaching this sermon today and not on Easter, the Sunday after Easter, the overconfidence cycle that stopped Thomas from believing in Jesus' resurrection is the very same cycle that got Jesus crucified in the first place. When Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin and put on trial, the members of the council already believed that Jesus was not the Messiah. They were convinced of that. Oh, yes, they sought evidence against Jesus and, and found the witnesses to be utterly lacking in truthfulness. At which point, in all the Gospels, the leaders asked Jesus, Are you the Messiah? In Matthew and Luke, and to some degree in John, Jesus replies, you say that I am. And because he didn't say no, they condemned him to death for blasphemy. In Mark, after trying to keep it a secret his entire ministry, Jesus finally says, yes, I am the Messiah. And they condemn him to death for it. At no point does anyone stop to ask Jesus questions like, what, why do you say this? What support can you give for your claim? At no point does anyone reflect a sense of curiosity, a delight in discovering something new. There is no humility, only hubris, backed by people's conviction that God is safe and sound in his little box, with nary a thought of doing anything new or even potentially unpredictable. That is why in Luke's gospel, in response to the elders and scribes asking, if you are the Messiah, tell us, Jesus replied, if I tell you, you will not believe, and if I question you, you will not answer. 
In other words, it wasn't blasphemy that got Jesus condemned. It wasn't doubt either. It was a lack of doubt, a lack of humility and curiosity that led the leaders and the crowds to do and say what they did. It also means that when our hearts get caught up in the cycle of overconfidence, we are just as surely a part of that crowd that shouted out, crucify him, crucify him. At the same time, the hubris of the leaders, the crowd, and our own are forgivable. Jesus died on the cross as a result of our sinfulness, as well as for the sake of our sinfulness. Jesus died in humility to lead us, to bring us to humility. He died to break the cycle of overconfidence and to start us in a new life with a new point of view where doubt is not an enemy, but a virtue of the cross to be cultivated. God was always up to something new in Jesus, something that, that flew in the face of the familiar and was bound to run amok of human hubris. The belief and conviction that we can know it all. Jesus came in humility to nurture our doubt, our curiosity, our delight in discovering that we, so that we might walk in humility with him and marvel at God's work that is bringing a new creation. Amen. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation to Christ in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Deborah and Elizabeth, our bishops, for Kirk, our pastor, and all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children, and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our siblings who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. 
Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith, and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teachings to Moses. Here are our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your grace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses to the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians, and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. <coughs> Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in your arms, hold all the worlds in the arms of your care, and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority, so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and you courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, wherever and ever. Amen.
cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O oh, come, let us worship him. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O oh, come, let us worship him. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O oh, come, let us worship him. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. May God be merciful and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. May God give us blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted, and you rested them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not deeper, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh. We just go on. They curl their lips, they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him, if God so delights in him. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you since ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws to me, like a slashing and roaring lion, and poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, my heart within my breast is melting wax. My strength is dried up. Like a potsherd, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of death. Packs of dogs come close, close me in. A band of evildoers circles around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones while they stare at me gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. You, O Lord, be not far away. O my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of wild bulls. You have rescued me. I will declare your name to my people in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All of you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. For you come, from you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. 
and the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God, for dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, though they in death, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to, saying to the Lord, The Lord has acted. 